At 10.30pm on August 2, 2006, Robert Wan rang the doorbell of his friend's house in Washington, D.C. He had arranged to spend the night at their house after working late in the city. He and his friends talked for a few minutes before heading up to bed, but less than an hour later, one of his friends made a 911 call. Robert had been stabbed three times and lay dead in the guest room. The evidence makes this one of the most confusing cases we've ever seen, and it remains unsolved. So who killed Robert Wan, and why? If you enjoy this video, then please give it a like, and please subscribe to the channel for more true crime videos. Robert Wan was a 32-year-old lawyer working in Washington, D.C. He lived in nearby Oakton, Virginia with his wife, Kathy. Robert grew up in New York, but went to the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And while at college, he met Joseph Price, after graduating in 1996, Robert went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and then he became a clerk to Judge Raymond A. Jackson of the Federal District Court of the Eastern District of Virginia. Robert then spent six years working in commercial real estate law, and also served as general counsel for the Organization of Chinese Americans. He was very active in the Asian American community, supporting numerous organizations, and he was also president-elect of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Association. Shortly before his death, Robert left his law firm and started a job as general counsel for Radio Free Asia. Radio Free Asia is a non-profit radio service funded by the US government. It broadcasts news, information and commentary for people living in Asia. The radio network has won many journalistic awards and aims to be a forum for a variety of opinions and voices from within Asian nations whose people do not fully enjoy freedom of expression. And since broadcasting began in 1996, Chinese authorities have consistently jammed its broadcasts. The mission and ethos of Radio Free Asia was something that Robert Wan cared about. By all accounts, he was a great person who cared deeply about people. During his time at college, he revitalized the Thirteen Club, a secret society that performed anonymous random acts of kindness. That's who Robert was, a kind person. He kept a spreadsheet with all of his friends' birthdays and never missed them. He was a good friend and people liked him. When Robert met Joseph Price at William & Mary, Joe was a senior, so he graduated three years before Robert. Joseph also went to law school and became a lawyer, specialising in intellectual property law. Joe has also been heavily involved in gay rights advocacy, and between 2002 and 2006, he served as general counsel for Equality Virginia. Robert and Joe were friends, but they weren't best friends. Robert's best friend was Jason Torchinsky, who he also met at William & Mary. Joe and Robert saw each other less than five times a year, but Joe did host Robert's 30th birthday party at his house, with the help of Jason. Joe and his partner, Victor Zaborski, also attended Robert's wedding. While they didn't see each other all the time, in his interview with police, Joe said after he met Robert, they became very, very close. Joe and Victor started dating in 2001, and a couple of years later, Dylan Ward entered the picture. He and Joe have a sexual relationship, and all three of them lived together at the house on Swan Street. The pair had a dominant submissive relationship with Dylan the Dom and Joe the Sub. Victor was not involved sexually with Dylan, but he described the three of them as a family. The trio lived at 1509 Swan Street in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., in a row house that Joe and Victor owned. The house was about 100 years old, and was three levels, not including the basement, where Sarah Morgan lived. She was a longtime friend of Joe and Victor, having known them both for several years. Sarah had a key to the house, and she would enter the basement apartment by going through the main house. From the patio, she would take the steps down to the basement. This information is important because on the night of Robert's death, Sarah said she wasn't going to be home. Let's look at the timeline of events in this case. Robert had recently begun working at Radio Free Asia and he wanted to meet the night shift workers. But since it would be a long commute home and he didn't want to arrive home late and interrupt his wife's sleep, he decided to stay the night in the city instead of going home. Robert asked a female friend he knew from college if he could stay at her place, but he also emailed Joe Price asking the same thing, and Joe got back to Robert first. So, Robert arranged to spend the night at Joe's house. This was arranged about a week beforehand, giving everyone plenty of notice. 
August 2nd, 2006 was a typical sticky hot summer day. That morning, Robert and his wife Kathy took the subway together, got off at DuPont Circle and kissed goodbye at 8.45 a.m. Robert headed off to work and spent the whole day there. At 9.30 p.m., Robert called Kathy and said he was going to meet the night shift workers shortly. His last words to her were, I love you. At 10.24 p.m., Robert called Joe to let him know he was about to get a cab to his house. Joe only lived about eight minutes away. At this time, Joe and Victor were in bed watching Project Runway. When Robert arrived at 1509 Swan Street, he was greeted at the door by Dylan. Joe came down and the three of them went to the kitchen where they all had some water and talked for 10 to 15 minutes. Victor stayed in bed watching the TV show. According to Dylan, he, Joe and Robert talked briefly about Robert's job, his wife's hip surgery, the broken shower in the master bedroom and other light topics. But it was getting late and everyone had to be up work for the next day, so they didn't talk much longer. Joe and Robert had arranged when confirming Robert's stay that they would have breakfast together to discuss some work-related issues. Robert was dealing with some copyright issues at his job, which was Joe's expertise, so they were going to discuss that in the morning. Joe refilled his water and then Dylan and Joe showed Robert the guest bedroom on the second floor. Although it wasn't really a bedroom, but an office that had a pull-out sofa bed. Robert asked if he could take a shower, so they showed him the bathroom, which was next to Dylan's room. Then Joe went upstairs to his and Victor's room on the third floor, and Dylan went to his own room, just down the hall from where Robert would be sleeping. After showering, Robert emails his wife to tell her that he had just showered and was about to go to bed. He then emails a co-worker to confirm a lunch meeting the next day. But strangely, these emails were not sent. They remained in the draft folder suggesting that he began to write them, but for some reason decided not to send them, or he was interrupted. But it's bizarre that whichever email was drafted first was not sent before he started writing the other. The last email was drafted at 11.07pm, so if Robert was the author of these emails, then he was still alive at this time. Then Robert changes into a William and Mary t-shirt and shorts, which he usually slept in, and put his night guard in, which he wore at night to prevent him from grinding his teeth while he slept. Meanwhile, Project Runway had just finished, and Joe was skipping through channels finding something else to watch. According to him, Victor was getting annoyed that he wasn't switching the TV off, so finally Joe turned off the TV and both of them went to sleep. At this time, Dylan was in his room reading, possibly the article in a magazine lying open in his room. Then he took a sleeping pill and also went to sleep. Sometime between 11pm and 11.30pm, the next door neighbour heard a scream. They were certain it was before 11.30 because they always watched the same news programme each night and the neighbour knew that the news anchor, Maureen Bunyan, was talking at the same time they heard the scream that news anchor did not appear again after 11.30 p.m. According to Victor, he woke up to screams. He said it was a low scream, followed by several grunts. According to Joe, the door chime woke him up. The chime was part of their security system whereby whenever the front or back door of the house was opened, there would be a noise that could be heard throughout the house. The door did not make a noise when it was closed. Victor and Joe leapt out of bed and went downstairs. Robert's door was open and they could see him lying on the bed. They went to him and discovered him lying down flat on his back. In his initial police interview, Joe said one of Robert's arms was out to the side and there was a bloody knife resting on his chest. Joe sat down next to Robert and moved the knife to the nightstand. He lifted up Robert's t-shirt and saw what he described as a puncture wound on his stomach and a lot of blood. Victor became hysterical, screaming and crying, which woke Dylan. Joe told Victor to go upstairs and call 911. So Victor ran upstairs, grabbed the phone and dialed 911. There was a phone in the room where Robert was, but Victor didn't use that phone. According to Joe, the reason Victor didn't use that phone is because he was hysterical, shaking and crying. Joe told Victor to go upstairs to make the call so that he could calm down and not have to be next to Robert's body, which was clearly distressing him. Victor called 911 at 11.49 p.m. NBC emergency 911 operator 6752. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Maybe, maybe, maybe an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? With this, 
We had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? I don't know. We heard... Are they bleeding? You see someone yes, bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he's... I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Is he cautious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay, and who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is, he, is, is he conscious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, listen to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Listen, is he, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you, okay? Is he breathing? I'm upstairs, and he's downstairs. I don't know. Okay, who's downstairs with him? My partner is downstairs with him right now. He told me to go upstairs and call the police immediately. Okay, who's the person? Okay, I'm sending paramedics and the police. Okay, who's the person that stabbed him? I don't know. We think it's somebody with an intruder in the house. We heard the chime of the door. <laughs> and it's 15, ma'am, calm down. 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. Am I correct? Yes, it is. The person that stabbed him, is he still in the home? I don't know. We got help in route, okay? Pardon me? We have help in route. Thank you. They're here. They are in route to you now. I'm saying the police and the paramedics, okay, to assist. Okay, what I need you to do is go downstairs, okay? The place where, wherever he was stabbed there, I need you to get a dry cloth, okay? And just apply pressure to that area. If he was wherever he was stabbed at on his body, I need you to take a towel downstairs while you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive and just apply pressure. Even if the rag or towel is saturated with blood, just get another towel and put it on top, but never lift the, the first towel off the area. Hold it on. Once it gets filled up with blood, just put another towel on top of that and just apply pressure until the paramedics arrive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With that, with that in the heart. In the heart? Yes. In the center of his chest. Okay. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? We have help him right now, okay? You don't know who it was? No idea. Don't touch, don't touch, just touch, just touch. Okay, is he breathing? He's breathing, but he needs help now. Okay, we have help in route, ma'am, okay? We do have help in route. Okay, just go down there and try to tell your husband or your other, um, the other half to just try to keep him calm and talk to him, okay? Keep him calm and talk to him until someone gets there. Okay. And at the same time, get a dry cloth and just hold it right there in the area. Yes, my partner's holding the okay, it, holding it on him. Okay, and once it gets saturated with blood, can I get another one? Go get another towel okay. so you can apply it on top of that one once it gets filled up with blood. Okay. We, need, well, we need you to apply pressure on that area. He is applying pressure right there. Okay, just hold it there until the paramedics get there. They should be pulling up any moment if they're already en route to your location. You don't know who did this. We have no idea who did this. Is the door open so they can get in? We don't know how they got in. Okay, well, I'm asking you now. Is the door open so the paramedics can get in once they get here? What? I'm sorry. What were you saying? Is the door open so they can get in? Is the okay. door open so the so the paramedics can get in the home? I'm going to go down. Is this a private home or apartment? It's, it's a home. It's a home. It's 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. The person had one of our knives. The person that stabbed him ran out the door with a knife? I, I think so. Uh, okay, anybody get any type of description of the person that came in the home? I have no idea. We have no description. We heard we heard the chime and and we heard the scream from our friends. Okay. And so we came running downstairs. We ran in. So you both was upstairs and your friend was downstairs? Yes. You heard the door open and then you heard the scream? We didn't. I didn't hear the door open until after the scream, and then we ran down the stairs, and we heard, we are, we have an alarm, and so the chime went off. Okay. Is the ambulance, please, we really need the ambulance. Okay, they in route, they in route now, ma'am. Go to the door, they should be pulling up any moment, okay? 
I'm afraid to get on the stairs. Okay, the person who's downstairs was the person that was assaulted. No, we're in the we're on the second floor. Okay, so somebody need to go downstairs, open the door for the paramedics. You're not sure if that person's still in the home or not. I have no idea. Okay, we have paramedics in row. Okay. What time is it? What time is it at the moment? Yes. Twenty-three fifty-four. It's eleven fifty-four, ma'am. Eleven fifty-four. Yes. I mean. I'll stay on the line with you. I will stay on the line until somebody gets here, okay? I won't hang up. We need them right now. I'm not hanging up, but we need, we need help now. Okay, they en route, ma'am. They are en route. <sighs> Let me know when you hear the paramedics. Can you look out the window and see if you hear them coming? I'm, I'm looking out the window, and I see nothing. I see nobody. Okay, it seems like forever, but they are en route, ma'am. They're coming. I'm here they are. Here they are. They're there. They're there. <laughs> I'm going downstairs. Okay. I'll stand in line with you till you open the door for the paramedics, okay? Help us. We have someone with stabbed They're on our second floor. <laughs> Ma'am. <laughs> no, it's really an emergency. I mean, he may be. He's hurry. <laughs> Ma'am, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Some people take issue with Victor asking the 911 operator what time it was, but Victor said that Joe was asking what was taking so long, and he asked Victor what time it was, and that's why Victor asked the 911 operator. But Victor must have gone back downstairs before he asked this question. Victor grabbed his robe and put it on as he went back downstairs. Victor tells the 911 operator that we think there was an intruder. In fact, he says we a lot, and most likely this means that he and Joe, and possibly Dylan as well, had talked before he called 911. But according to Joe, as soon as they saw Robert, Victor started screaming, and not even a minute later, Joe told Victor to go upstairs and call 911. So this story doesn't add up. By saying we think there was an intruder means that at some point between finding Robert and dialing 911, Victor and Joe tried to figure out what happened. It could have only been for a few seconds, but neither Joe nor Victor tell police this. In fact, they say the exact opposite. They say they did not ask each other what happened or discuss it in any way. Another point that supports this is that Victor tells the 911 operator, we think he had one of our knives. If Victor did not get close to Robert, but immediately started screaming and went upstairs, how did he know that the knife lying on Robert's chest was from their own kitchen? According to him, he didn't inspect it, and Joe did not say anything about it, so why would Victor say this? And the biggest we of them all was Victor saying, we heard the chime. In his police interview that night, Victor said he did not hear the chime, and he woke up to screams. So why would he say we heard the chime on the 911 call unless he had had a conversation with Joe and Joe told him he heard the chime? Surely these we statements must mean that Victor did not immediately call 911 upon finding Robert. He and Joe must have had a conversation first, even if it was brief. But if it was an innocent conversation, why didn't they mention it to police? Further evidence that they did not call 911 immediately is the neighbor's statement about hearing a scream before 11.30 p.m. If the neighbor heard a scream before 11.30, that means there was at least 19 minutes between the scream and the 911 call. If the scream came from Victor, which is likely considering he said he screamed at the top of his lungs, then the men are lying when they said they immediately called 911 after finding Robert. But this implies that the neighbour is 100% correct and the scream came before 11.30pm. It is possible that the neighbour was mistaken about the time and it came much later. 
but the neighbour, William Thomas, is positive the scream happened at the same time that WJLA TV newscaster Maureen Bunyan was talking in the background. He said, I know her voice after all these years. His wife, Claudia, was watching TV downstairs when William heard the scream. When asked by police if she could have been watching a later news programme, she said, I like Maureen Bunyan, and that's who I watched. Only five minutes after placing the call, an ambulance arrives at the house and Victor lets them inside. The paramedic goes upstairs and encounters Dylan coming out of the bathroom wearing a white bathrobe. He asks Dylan what's going on, and Dylan simply points towards Robert's room without saying a word. He then goes into his bedroom and shuts the door. The paramedic walks down the hall into the room and sees Joe sitting on the bed in his underwear with his back to him. He's not applying pressure to the wound. The paramedic asks Joe what's going on. Joe gets up and says, I heard a scream. He says nothing more and stands there as the paramedic attends to Robert. The paramedic senses something is off and keeps one eye on Joe while he examines Robert. Robert is quickly taken to hospital and Joe calls Kathy to tell her that Robert had been stabbed and she needs to go to the hospital. Unfortunately, Robert is pronounced dead. The police arrived shortly after the paramedics and once Robert had been taken to hospital, the police made Joe, Victor and Dylan sit downstairs. All three were wearing their bathrobes and this could be the reason why they were described as appearing freshly showered. It's not clear if any of them looked wet, but all three of them did have showers that evening before dinner. According to one of the officers, Dylan began to speak, but Joe gave him a menacing look and Dylan stopped talking. Apparently, Joe was the talker and officers knew that he was the leader of the group. Joe was the glue that held the family together because he had a romantic relationship with Victor and a sexual one with Dylan. Police had the men get dressed and then took them down to the police station for questioning. It's important to note that the men were not under arrest and were free to leave at any point, but all three agreed to talk to the police. At the police station, the men were interviewed separately. Let's look at these interviews and pick out a few key points. We'll start with Joe. In his interview, Joe appears confident. His body language is open as if he has nothing to hide and he repeatedly says that what happened is crazy. He is either genuinely confused about what happened to Robert or he is acting confused. Either he's really innocent or he is so used to arguing cases as a lawyer that he is confident he can get the police to believe him. Either way, his body language suggests he is open to any question. However, as the interview goes on, Joe appears to become more frustrated. He starts to close his fist as he talks as if he's trying to hammer home a point and the police are not buying it. He also says, you guys are killing me, like he's getting fed up with the questions. But this isn't necessarily an indicator of guilt. If an innocent person is repeatedly asked the same questions, it's understandable to get frustrated when you're not believed. In fact, innocent people are more likely to have emotional outbursts when accused of something they didn't do. As the interview progresses, Joe gets more and more frustrated, and if he's innocent, it's understandable. The detectives make Joe repeat himself several times, even when he is perfectly clear about what he's saying. They often take what he said and twist his words or misconstrue them when Joe is being perfectly clear. Perhaps this is a tactic to rile him up, or maybe the detectives aren't very good at listening. The detectives look lazy, slouching far down in their seats. They often look bored and unprofessional. In this police interview, we know that Joe is feeling the pressure, and not just through his words, but through his body language. Joe constantly touches his face, which is something people do to self-soothe when they feel anxious or uncomfortable. It's a pacifying behaviour that releases comforting endorphins. Similar behaviours include rubbing one's neck, touching their hair, or fiddling with jewellery. Joe tells the detectives that Dylan discovered the back door was slightly open. Joe says that the front door was definitely locked, but he can't be sure if he locked the back door. When Robert came over and they were talking in the kitchen, Joe said he saw a big bug on one of the lights outside, so he went outside to look. When he came back inside, he can't remember if he locked the door. 
According to Joe, the murderer must have come in the house via the back door. He's convinced an intruder killed Robert. Joe said, I know you guys will find evidence that someone else was in our house. Remember, Joe said he heard the chime which woke him up, suggesting that the door was opened. But the story of the chime is a bit confusing because Joe and Victor's timing of the chime doesn't match. And initially, Joe thought Sarah Morgan had come home even though she said she was going to be out all night. It wasn't Sarah, and she did stay out all night. In his police interview, Joe says the chime woke him up and he thought that Sarah had come home. He rolls over and tries to go back to sleep, but moments later, he hears grunting noises and a low scream. But in his police interview, Victor says he woke up to screaming and then he heard the chime. So it's not exactly clear whether the scream or the chime happened first. And was there a scream or was it grunting? Victor also mentions that he thinks he heard the chime a second time, but isn't sure. Joe did not hear it again. Another thing to note is that 1509 Swan Street was an old house over 100 years and the wooden stairs creaked. The detectives said they could hear people walking up and down them even when they were on the top floor of the house. So they asked Joe if an intruder ran out of the house after murdering Robert, wouldn't he have heard them? Joe isn't sure, but then contends that yes, he probably would have heard someone running down the stairs, but he didn't. So wouldn't that mean the intruder was still in the house? Or more likely, there wasn't an intruder at all. It seems that Joe is stumped to come up with an answer for this line of questioning. So he changes the conversation by reiterating that he knows, without a shadow of a doubt, neither Victor nor Dylan killed Robert. The police say he can't know that, but Joe says he does because they couldn't even punch someone. Detectives then say to Joe that they have yet to hear him say that he didn't do it. And Joe doesn't deny it. Instead, he says he doesn't need to say he didn't do it because Robert was one of his oldest friends. But as Joe gets more frustrated as the interview goes on, he repeatedly says, we didn't do it. The detectives then ask questions about Robert's sexuality. They can't seem to grasp that a straight man would be friends with gay men or stay overnight at their house without some kind of sexual motive. They can't understand why Joe would keep in contact with Robert over all these years unless he found him attractive. While some people argue this line of questioning comes across as homophobic, establishing the relationship dynamic of the four men is important in order to figure out the motive. Maybe the motive was jealousy. But Joe is adamant that Robert was straight and not at all closeted. However, Joe does seem focused on making sure the detectives know just how smart he is. He says things like, I know you're focused on us. I know you guys have to come at me like 10 times and see if the story sticks. I take people's depositions, question them for eight hours a day. I know how the game works. Joe is used to being the top dog at work and at home, so maybe he wants the officers to know whatever tricks they have, it's not going to work on him. But Joe is still using we instead of I. If Joe was guilty, maybe he would be more concerned about saving himself and try to place suspicion on one of the others. Guilty people often try to point the finger at others, but Joe doesn't do this at all. Maybe he really didn't do anything, and truly believes Victor and Dylan didn't either. However, there is one huge glaring problem with Joe's story that cannot be ignored. Officer Diane Durham, who arrived at the house as the EMTs were taking Robert out to the ambulance, described the scene upon seeing Joe, Victor and Dylan. She said, One was dressed only in a pair of white speedo underwear. One male was standing by the steps, the other was sitting in the chair. The male in the underwear did all the talking. He said they heard someone scream and ran downstairs to see. He said the victim was at the patio door, bleeding. They opened the door, took him upstairs and laid him on the bed. This statement is completely different to Joe and Victor's story that they found Robert on the bed. Officer Durham left the house to go to the hospital and suggested that Joe put on some clothes as more detectives would be arriving. After this, the only story they tell is that they found Robert on the bed and the patio is not mentioned again. So what is the truth? If they found Robert bleeding on the patio, why take him up to the guest bed? If they wanted to move him, why not just carry him over to the couch on the same floor? There's no way they would carry him up the stairs to the bed. There's no reason to, unless they were staging the scene. 
but perhaps this is what they were doing during the 19 minute minimum gap before they called 911. Something important to mention about Joe's interview is that Joe asks, can we leave? Do we need to call a lawyer now? And Detective Norris replies, if you think you did it, then you might want to call a lawyer. Here, the detective infers that only if Joe is guilty should he call a lawyer. Joe is entitled to have an attorney present, whether guilty or innocent, and the detective knows this. He's being manipulative and continues questioning. The detective does the same thing with Victor and Dylan. During Victor's interview, there is a break, and during the break, the detective learns that Victor asked about having a lawyer. The detective ignores this and tells Victor that he is there voluntarily, effectively dismissing his request for a lawyer and encouraging Victor to continue talking. And during Dylan's interview, he suggests Dylan take a lie detector, and Dylan asks if he needs a lawyer for that. The detective says, what do you need a lawyer for? You don't need a lawyer. I mean, if I didn't do it, what I need a lawyer for? It's absurd and untrue, but the three men are easily swayed to continue talking. Now let's look at Victor's police interview. Victor's demeanor is wildly different than Joe's. He's clearly distressed and can't even look at the officers in the eye. He seems like a person in shock. According to both him and Joe, he was hysterical. Victor described Robert as a casual friend. He said they saw each other maybe three or four times a year, but he couldn't tell you five things about his life. Dylan also described their relationship with Robert as casual. It's only Joe who said that they were very, very close. Joe never told Victor that Robert was staying over that night. Victor was away on a business trip but came home early and arrived at the house at about 6.30 p.m. He wasn't due home until past midnight. Dylan was exercising at home and Joe was at the gym. So Victor unpacked, then went to the gym for 30 minutes or so, then came home and took a shower. Joe and Dylan also took showers that evening before the three of them had dinner together. They cooked steaks on the grill outside and had wine. After cleaning up, it was only when Victor saw Dylan making up the pullout couch that Victor learned that Robert was spending the night. He asked Joe about it and Joe confirmed that Robert was crashing there and they planned to have breakfast together. It's unknown how Victor felt about this, but it seems that he was fine with it because he helped Dylan make up the bed. The reason he stayed in bed when Robert arrived was because he was tired from his work trip and didn't want to chat. It's understandable. The detectives ask Victor if Dylan could have killed Robert, and like Joe, Victor says no. He says he's not a violent person, he's one of the nicest, sweetest people I've ever met. Joe and Victor both have the same theory that an intruder came in to rob them and then killed Robert, but nothing was stolen. Robert's phone and wallets were in the room with him, and it seems highly unlikely that a burglar would go upstairs before ransacking the first floor. There was a laptop on the first floor which wasn't taken. But Victor is sure that Joe and Dylan didn't kill Robert, so the only option left is the intruder theory. And like Joe, he doesn't understand it either, but he's sure that that must have been what happened. Throughout the interview, Victor rubs his forehead a lot as if he's trying to remember everything. He's all over the place, inserting details and clarifying things. At one point, he mentioned he has post-nasal drip, so he has to take Sudafed, but it keeps him up, so he took a sleeping aid. Innocent people tend to get as much information out as they can, sometimes saying what they remember as soon as they remember it. Guilty people often have a rehearsed story, but Victor doesn't sound rehearsed. Victor said he fell asleep quickly, but was woken by screams he described as a low, breathy grunt, but loud. He said he and Joe jumped out of bed, flipped the light on, and ran downstairs. Upon seeing Robert, Victor said he started screaming at the top of his lungs and immediately went upstairs to call 911. Despite saying we think there was an intruder to the 911 operator, Victor said that neither Joe nor Dylan said that, but it was his assumption. Maybe this is true and because he's been in a relationship with Joe for five years at this point, he's just used to saying we all the time. But it doesn't come across that way on the phone call. It comes across like he and Joe had discussed what they thought happened. Just like Joe, Victor describes how one of Robert's arms was out to the side, and Victor said it looked twisted and awkward. At first he thought he saw Robert's hand on his stomach, but he couldn't be certain. 
Victor also said he did not hear anybody running down the stairs, but said the intruder could have run when he and Joe were running down at the same time, in which case he might not have heard them. Victor also said he heard the chime at the same time that he was screaming after seeing Robert. The chime is a mystery, even with Victor. In the 911 call, Victor said, we heard the chime. In the first part of his police interview, he said he did not hear the chime, that he woke up to screaming. But in the second part of the interview, he says he heard the chime when he started screaming after seeing Robert. So it's unclear whether there was one chime or two and which one Victor heard. If we take both Joe and Victor's version of events, Joe hears the chime, wakes up, then hears grunting or low screams, and this wakes Victor up. And they both leap out of bed, run downstairs and find Robert dead, Victor starts screaming, hears a chime, and then goes up to call 911. If this is true, it means that someone came in the house and then within a couple of minutes goes upstairs, stabs Robert, then runs downstairs and out the door. It's so quick that it seems impossible. It's so quick that it's less likely a burglar stumbling across Robert and more likely a targeted attack. Someone comes in, goes straight to Robert, kills him and then leaves. But there's no evidence that Robert had any enemies. However, he did just start a new job at Radio Free Asia, and that radio network did have enemies, notably China and other Asian countries that tried to block it from broadcasting. Maybe Robert's death was related to work, and someone knew that he was spending the night away from his wife. Maybe he was followed to the house that night. But there's no evidence, at least the police, as far as we know, didn't look into it. The detectives asked Victor when he first saw Dylan. Victor said they saw Dylan when he came downstairs as he was on the phone with 911. Dylan was standing in the doorway to the office where Robert was and looked white as a ghost and looked shocked. Victor tells the 911 operator he is too scared to go downstairs in case there is someone still in the house, so he waits for the ambulance upstairs. As soon as he sees them through the window, he goes downstairs to the first floor to let them in. It seems that all three men are certain that an intruder came in the house via the back door. According to Victor, it would not have been too difficult because the killer could have climbed on their car in the alley to hoist themselves over the fence, and then when leaving, they could have climbed back over the fence by stepping on the brick wall where the plants were. The neighbour said there was an indentation on the lid of their sandbox by the fence, suggesting that someone may have stepped on it if climbing down from a fence. Finally, let's turn to Dylan's interview. Unlike Joe, Dylan sits quite still in his interview, with his ankles crossed and his hands mostly clasped in front of him. This could suggest he's feeling stressed and he's in the freeze response. Dylan moves his hands throughout the interview, opening them with palms up as he speaks. This is usually a sign of openness and honesty. But unlike Joe and Victor, Dylan's responses are lacking in detail and void of emotion. Perhaps he is just in shock or really tired. Remember, this interview was in the middle of the night and detectives interviewed Dylan last. As with Joe, the detectives come across as ignorant and homophobic. They say to Dylan, this guy's perfectly straight and he's going to leave his wife for the night and come over to yours house? Then he's not perfectly straight. That's not something a straight guy would do. He also questions Dylan about how many straight friends from high school he is in constant contact with, to which Dylan replies he's not in constant contact with any friends from high school. The detectives then ask why is Joe constantly in contact with someone who's straight from high school? Why is this dude Robert and Joe in contact if Robert is straight? This cop is being ridiculous. The detectives disregard the intruder theory because they cannot grasp that a straight man would be platonic friends with gay men. In their opinion, the murder had to be related to sex or a romantic interest. They also asked Dylan why Joe was in his underwear and can't seem to grasp that he simply ran downstairs in his underwear because that's what he slept in. Dylan said that he was dozing off but wasn't fully asleep when he heard a commotion. He said he heard a short, high-pitched sound or scream. This lines up with what Victor said. Victor described his own scream as high-pitched. After hearing it, he didn't get up right away, but once he heard a commotion between Victor and Joe, he got up and went to see what was going on. Dylan said his first thought was that someone had broken into the house and he was scared to go downstairs. In the interview, he says he is still scared because someone was killed in their house. 
The detective seems to push Dylan on whether he thinks Joe and Victor killed Robert, to which Dylan keeps saying he can't imagine them doing it. The detective does not focus on whether Dylan killed Robert, but rather if he was covering for Joe and Victor. He says no. Dylan's interview is quite straightforward. He answers the questions without going into much more detail than is necessary, unlike Joe, who talks and talks. And Dylan doesn't seem emotional at all, unlike Victor, who seems distraught. But Dylan constantly says he doesn't know when detectives ask him questions about the night. Maybe the detectives were bad at interrogations, or maybe Dylan really didn't know anything more. But the interview is frustrating because they go round and round in circles with Dylan saying he doesn't know every other sentence. Dylan's story doesn't change and matches up with what Joe and Victor said happened. Of course, they may have had time to come up with a story that they've stuck to for all these years. For what it's worth, Dylan says he did not hear a chime. Let's turn to the investigation. According to the autopsy report, Dr. Lois Goslinowski, the chief medical examiner for the District of Columbia, said Robert was stabbed three times, with the fatal stab to his heart. She therefore concluded that he died of stabbing and the manner of death was homicide. According to her report, the wounds measured four to five inches in length and were oriented to the 10 o'clock and four o'clock position. The sharp part of the knife was oriented to the top of the wound, and the blunt edge of the knife was at the bottom of the wound. It means that the knife was held upside down. The stab wounds were described as slit-like. They were carefully done with no tearing, no struggle, and were made intentionally and methodically. In other words, it was not a violent, brutal attack with Robert fighting for his life. This also meant that Robert must have been immobilized when the stabbing occurred. The knife found on the nightstand next to Robert's body was placed there by Joe. Joe said that he found the knife lying on Robert's chest and he moved it. After his police interview, Joe contacted a female friend and he said to her that he actually removed the knife from Robert's chest. When Joe was later questioned about this, he couldn't recall whether the knife was in Robert's chest or not. So we don't know for sure whether the knife was still in Robert's chest or not when Joe found him. Investigators have said that the knife found was not actually the murder weapon. The knife was coated with blood, but it did not have fibers from Robert's t-shirt that he was wearing that night. However, the knife did have fibers from the towel that was found in the room. Additionally, police suspect that the patterns on the knife show that the towel was used to wipe blood onto the knife, as if it was being staged as the murder weapon. Additionally, police found a three-piece knife set in Dylan's room, but one of the knives was missing. Police went out and bought the same set so they could take a look at the missing knife. After examining the wounds, they thought that the smaller knife better matched than the larger knife found next to Robert. Since the wounds measured four to five inches in length, the knife found next to Robert was not pushed in all the way, which they found odd. They couldn't find this missing knife anywhere in the house. But Dylan's mother came forward and handed police the missing knife from the set. She had gifted the set to Dylan, but kept the smaller knife for herself, apparently. In addition to blood, the knife found next to Robert also contained tiny cut hairs from Robert's chest and a glob of tissue fat. If the knife was staged, it's unlikely that the blade would have these on them. That's not something that the killer would think to place on the knife. A cadaver dog, trained to alert when it detects decaying human cells and blood, hit on two places in the home. The first was in a lint trap of a dryer found on the second floor next to Dylan's room. The second area was in a drain found outside near the basement door by the hose. The drain lid appeared to have been disturbed as if someone had recently removed it and failed to place it back properly. The hose next to the drain was found untangled, again like it had been used recently. So was the hose used to wash off bloody clothes? The medical examiner noted that Robert had lost two thirds of his blood. The defense said that he bled internally, but the medical examiner doesn't agree with this theory. So where did the blood go? It suggests that either the scene was cleaned or Robert was not killed in the guest room where he was found. But how would an intruder have time to move him? And why would they move him? The Metropolitan Police Department expected to find much more blood at the scene, but there was no blood found in the house other than the two softball-sized puddles on the bed and a couple of splotches on a towel. 
The MPD said that the amount of blood found at the scene was inconsistent with a violent stabbing, and they suspected that the scene had been cleaned. To confirm their suspicion, they did some testing, but did not use a common luminal test. Instead, investigators used a chemical known as Ashley's reagent, which is not designed to detect blood, but can be used to enhance blood patterns, such as a bloody footprint or fingerprint. This chemical reacts to proteins found on several household surfaces, such as floor finishers, paint and dyes. When used at 1509 Swan Street, the chemical reacted to several areas throughout the house, including on walls, floors, stairs and doors. The MPD collected 160 samples from these areas and sent them for testing. The FBI lab determined that there was no blood on any of these samples. Consequently, the MPD removed many of these areas from the house so that they could be tested directly. They removed walls, stairs, flooring, parts of the ceiling and other areas, causing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage to the house. But again, the FBI found that there was no blood on any of those items. So while more blood may have been in the house and cleaned up, we will never know because investigators used the wrong chemical, which simply reacted to the finishings on the surfaces. But the MPD also sent every sink trap in the house, which tested negative for both blood and cleaning supplies. It means that blood wasn't washed down the drains in the house. The FBI also tested both the lint trap in the dryer and the samples taken from the drain outside. Again, no blood was found. DNA was found in the lint trap, and Joe, Victor and Dylan could not be excluded, but this was expected given it was their dryer in their own house. Robert's DNA was not found. So while the medical examiner does not buy the opinion that Robert bled internally, perhaps it is true. The police said the blood found was inconsistent with a violent stabbing, but this was not a violent, passionate, angry stabbing. Robert's stab wounds were uniform without tearing. The medical examiner said that the stabs happened while Robert was incapacitated, which is why he had no defense wounds. So this means that the stabs would have been intentionally and methodically done, perhaps even performed slowly. So would those types of stabs cause blood to be spattered across the room? Probably not. Maybe there wasn't much blood to clean up after all. Further, the defense for Joe, Victor and Dylan had three forensic pathologists and an ER doctor review the case. They all concur that the quantity of blood at the scene is consistent with the degree of bleeding that would be expected from the particular stab wounds suffered by Mr. Wan. A stab wound of the chest where a major vessel of the heart is penetrated will cause massive internal bleeding. Abdominal stab wounds, even fatal ones, rarely have significant external bleeding. As for the toxicology report, Robert tested negative for common date rape drugs, benzodiazepines, barbiturates and opiates, but it's possible he was drugged with something they did not test for. For example, a tranquilizer. One tranquilizer is xylazine, which is a non-opioid animal tranquilizer approved for veterinary use, but street drugs are often cut with it. It was first detected in overdose fatalities in Philadelphia in April 2006. Philadelphia is not far from DC, and maybe Robert was incapacitated with something similar to this. The medical examiner reported that blood had filled Mr. Warren's intestine a distance of two feet down from where the stomach attaches to the intestine. This finding indicates that Mr. Warren was alive for a considerable period of time after he was stabbed, as his digestive system continued to operate, forcing blood into his intestine. But one medical expert has opined that only gravity was needed for blood to flow two feet down. If Robert was carried upstairs, it's possible his top half was in a vertical position if one person held his legs and the other held him beneath his armpits. This would allow for blood to flow to his intestine without necessarily meaning he was still alive at the time. However, they did still find electrical activity, which is why Robert was taken to hospital and they tried to save his life there. Furthermore, the medical examiner noted that lividity was present on the back of Robert's body, but was not fixed, suggesting the body was moved after death. Had Robert died on his back and remained on his back for six to eight hours, lividity would have been fixed. Of course, the emergency services had to move Robert to put him on the stretcher, which could account for this, but moving the body could also account for this. 
Petechial hemorrhaging was found, which suggests at some point Robert was asphyxiated, but there is no evidence he was strangled. It's therefore more likely that he was smothered or his airways were blocked for a period of time, perhaps with a hand over his mouth. One perplexing aspect of this case is the fact that the medical examiner noted Robert having several needle marks on his body. Many people speculate that Robert was injected with a kind of paralytic to incapacitate him, which would account for his body being still when he was stabbed. The prosecution said that several of the needle marks were pre-mortem, in other words, before Robert died. But medical staff say that several of the needle marks were from them trying to place an IV into Robert, and therefore people speculate that not all of the needle marks are accounted for. However, it seems more likely than not that all of the needle marks were due to medical intervention. The medical examiner noted two catheters, one on the left side of Robert's neck and one on his right thigh. Additional needle marks were found on the left side of the neck, the left elbow, the back of the left hand, and around the right ankle and foot. There were also some needle marks on his chest, consistent with a procedure done to remove fluid around the heart. Robert also had chest tubes inserted. It seems likely that all of these needle marks were from medical intervention because they are all consistent with areas where doctors and nurses would place cannulas. Even the needle mark on the front of Robert's ankle and foot, which some people think is a weird placement, is not. The top of the foot by the dorsal venous arch leads to the greater saphenous vein. It's entirely probable that medical staff tried to place an IV here too. Therefore, we do not think that the needle marks suggest anything nefarious. Six swabs were taken from Robert's thighs, genitals and rectum, and semen was found. But the quantity was so small that the samples had to be combined to develop a DNA profile. And the DNA, it turned out to be Robert's. Yes, Robert's own semen was found in his rectum. Robert was meticulous about getting rid of the sticky sweat on his skin every day, and according to his wife, had a shower every night. According to Joe and Dylan, Robert had a shower the night he stayed over. Robert wrote an email to his wife at 11.05 p.m., though it was unsent, saying he had just showered and was going to bed. But since semen was found, the prosecution alleged that Robert had been sexually assaulted after he took a shower. But Robert was found wearing his night guard, which he put in before bed to prevent him grinding his teeth while he slept. If Robert was having consensual sex with someone, it's unlikely he would do it with his night guard in. So perhaps Robert showered, got ready for bed, and put his night guard in, wrote an email to his wife and his co-worker, but was interrupted before he could send them. The prosecution alleged that Robert had been immobilised, sexually assaulted, restrained, and stabbed. Upon a search of Dylan's room, investigators found a swath of BDSM equipment. Joe and Dylan used these objects in their sexual relationship, with Dylan being the dominant one. We know this because there was photographic evidence found on Joe's computer. Some of the items found included body harnesses, restraints, hoods, blindfolds, neck collars, mouth gags, and a wide range of toys. They also found several books, including The Slave Training Manual and Juice, Electricity for Pain and Pleasure. A large focus was placed on an electrical device found amongst the BDSM equipment. The device was a shockwave generator operated via remote control, which allowed the dominant person to administer shocks to the submissive person. These shocks could result in ejaculation. Therefore, much speculation has been placed on this device being used on Robert to make him ejaculate without his consent. But none of Robert's DNA was found on any of the toys or BDSM equipment found in the house. The fact that the presence of semen was so small suggests that either Robert did not ejaculate that night, perhaps the semen was from a previous day and he did not wash it all off. We have no way of knowing how thoroughly Robert washed himself in those areas. Or it means that if he was sexually assaulted, it's more likely that it happened before he showered since the quantity was so small and a lot of it had been washed off. There are no other suspects in this case other than Joe, Dylan and Victor, at least that we know of. But another person who often gets mentioned is Joe's brother, Michael Price. We know that Michael was somewhat violent because in his police interview, Joe said that Michael used to beat him up when they were younger. And apparently this happened several times. And Michael's partner at the time of Robert's death said that Michael had once attacked him. 
Michael was a drug addict, also gay, and was found to have burgled the Swan Street house on October 30th, just two months after Robert's death. He stole TVs, DVD players, and other electronics. Interestingly, Michael was studying to become a phlebotomist and attended class from 5pm to 9.15pm twice a week from June 7th to August 23rd. He only ever missed one class, and that was on the night that Robert was killed. But the reason that Michael missed his class that night was because he had spent the day with his nephews. You see, Joe and Victor had fathered two kids with a lesbian couple, so Michael was at their house all day. He apparently was teaching one of them to ride a bike. And we know this is true because at 4.50pm that day, one of the women and Michael called Joe to tell him that the child had ridden his bike without training wheels. So we know that Michael was there all the way up until 4.50pm, his class started at 5pm, and he ended up staying longer than he had planned, and so instead of missing the beginning of his class that night, he just decided to skip the entire class. So he went home, and then spent the evening watching television with his partner. The prosecution speculated that since his class often took place in a hospital, he could have had easy access to multiple paralytics and stolen some. But why would he do this unless he planned to use them on somebody? And if he did, why Robert? There are many scenarios about what could have happened that night. There is simply not enough evidence to tell us the full story. Victor's emotions could be real. He was in shock and hysterical when he saw Robert, but he loves Joe and Dylan and wants to protect them, so he goes along with the intruder story. Perhaps Joe and Dylan planned the attack in advance. Victor was not supposed to be home that night until much later, but ended up coming home early. Joe never told him that Robert was going to be staying, even though he knew about it for at least a week. But Joe did tell Dylan about Robert's visit a couple of days before. It may even be the case that Victor is not covering anything up. It's possible that Joe or Dylan acted alone and once he dragged Robert's body back to the guest bed, that's when Victor and maybe Joe came downstairs. Maybe Victor was told it was an intruder and he believed it. It's very difficult to piece together the actual timeline in this case. We don't know if Robert was sexually assaulted. We don't know if he was paralyzed. We don't know if he was suffocated. We don't really know if that was the murder weapon. There are so many unknowns, but one thing we do know is that Robert's death hit his wife Kathy extremely hard. She said, my accomplishment of the day was getting out of bed, taking a shower and making it to the breakfast table. The mere act of existing was almost unbearable. I was convinced I would never know happiness again. At first, Kathy believed their story and even asked Joe to be a pallbearer at Robert's funeral. But on November 25th, 2008, Kathy Wan filed a $20 million four-count wrongful death suit against the three men, and it was settled out of court. Joe, Victor, and Dylan were not charged with murder. They were charged with conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and Joe was also charged with tampering of evidence. They had a bench trial that began May 17th, 2010. There wasn't a jury, only a judge. Judge Lynn Leibovitz was the judge in this case, and she said that she was convinced that the knife found next to Robert was the murder weapon. But she did not believe the intruder theory, saying, I am satisfied that an intruder did not commit the murder. She said it was likely that Joe pulled the knife from Robert's chest based on his statements, but she could not conclude beyond a reasonable doubt he tampered with evidence. She found them all not guilty on all three charges but it seems from the judge's order that she believed the men were involved with Robert's death, but it wasn't proven beyond reasonable doubt. She said, It is very probable that the government's theory is correct, that even if the defendants did not participate in the murder, some or all of them knew enough about the circumstances of it to provide helpful information to law enforcement and have chosen to withhold that information for reasons of their own. My verdicts represent my effort to fairly and impartially follow the rule of law, my focus on the difference between moral certainty and evidentiary certainty in this case is probably cold comfort to those who loved Robert Wan and wished for some measure of peace or justice, and I am extremely sorry for this. I believe, however, that the reasonable doubt standard is essential to maintaining our criminal justice system as the fair and just system we wish it to be. 
Let's say Joe, Victor, and Dylan are telling the truth. They think it was an intruder because none of them killed Robert, but there's no evidence of an intruder other than Joe saying the door chime woke him. So what theory is left? As unlikely as it may be, let's consider the theory that Robert took his own life. It would explain a few things. No one heard anybody run down the stairs. He made low grunting noises, maybe because he was trying not to scream. He chose to kill himself at Joe's because he didn't want to do it at home for his wife to find him. There was no struggle, no defense wounds, no tearing, and it explains why all stab wounds were uniform. It could also explain the unsent emails. He started writing them but couldn't finish them. Maybe he didn't know what to say to his wife. Instead of deleting the emails, they were automatically saved as drafts. We never know what a person is going through mentally, and suicidal people are often great at masking and pretending everything is fine. But killing oneself by stabbing is uncommon, constituting just 3% of suicides. But in one American study published in 2012, 78% of those with self-inflicted stab wounds were male, and the most common injury site was the abdomen, neck, and chest. 98% of these patients were suicidal. But the medical examiner concluded Robert's death was a homicide. The intruder story seems unlikely, but it also seems unlikely that one of his oldest friends would kill him. But there are certainly discrepancies that cannot be ignored. It seems clear that there was a delay in calling 911 based on the we statements made by Victor, the mystery of the chime, and the neighbor's statement. Are these men hiding something, or are they being truthful? Was it really an intruder? Was someone already in the house? Did someone follow Robert to the house? And was it a targeted attack? In any case, Robert was, by all accounts, a kind and loving man who died too young, and he is missed by many, many people. So what do you think happened to Robert Wan? Do you think Joe, Victor, and Dylan are innocent? Or do you think they had something to do with his death? Leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more videos.